So um, I'm going to start with um, a short story that I read, which was published in 1987, Bel Patra. Bel Patra, for those who do not know, is a leaf. Do you know the English of Bel Patra? Does anyone know? I don't know. It's very, very, it's sacred and it is offered to Lord Shiva, you know, during all the pujas, during all the uh, offerings that we made to Lord Shiva the Bel Patra, and also there is a fruit, the juice of which is consumed in copious amounts during summer months. So that is Bel Juice, Bel Patra. So that's the title of the story, 1987 it was written. And uh, even at that time when I read it, and it's in Hindi, I read it in Hindi, and it's the story of Om and Fatima. And, uh, you know, uh, it's obvious by the names that it's an interreligious marriage. And the first scene really made me laugh because Fatma uh, stamps on cow dung, which is very, very sacred to the Hindus. And it's also eaten, but that's another conversation. And, you know, so um, there is a bit of a dialogue there where Om says, you know, it's good for you. So Fatima is very irritated. And then the story, you know, moves forward. I want to ask you, um, um, the cliched question first, was it an inspiration, friends who were married, a Hindu and a Muslim, or, I mean, 1987 at that time, because, you know, Babri hadn't happened. So for me, it was like straight out of nowhere for me, you know, one was young and one was reading. So what inspired you, Gitanjali? Well, first of all, let me say thanks. It's such a wonderful moment oh, yeah. to be here. And uh, at first I thought, uh, it's the wrongest possible place to be talking about work. But then I thought it's the most wonderful place because oh, yeah. one can be completely relaxed. So I'm carrying my gin, which is a lie. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I'm completely relaxed. Yes. I'm also relaxed because I'm with Sudha, who knows it all. So I don't really know what I have to say. Uh, what is it, a compliment? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but anyway. About the story, uh, Sudha, I mean, anyone who comes from North India, hmm. um, would be surrounded by oh. interfaith marriages. Gee. I mean, I, I have, I've grown up with those around me, friends um, and people I know. And let me also say that Babri Masjid is not the beginning of anything. Babri Masjid is one of the ugly climactic moments mm. of something. So the, um, the not inspiration is somehow, you know, because it's such a sad story or at least a disturbing story. So I don't know what word I should be using, but uh, the idea or the concern with uh, this theme was something I have grown up with. It's a very eclectic, mixed culture that North India and particularly, well, we saw Muzaffar Ali's, we heard him yes. and saw his uh, film, and we know very much yeah. about you know, that uh, very mixed mm -hmm. uh, culture. And I've grown up on that. And in the middle of all that, there are these divisive and uh, disturbing things, which have also been happening in um, you know, bits and pieces right. for a long, long time, and much, much worse today, much sharper today. So the story was there in the air, in me, all around me. It didn't have to be one right. example. But I, what I find interesting is the name of the couple, Om and Fatima. You know, it's, it's got, for me, I mean, it, at that time at least, I mean, there were multiple, Bel Patra, Om, Fatima. And the impression that it gave me was, as long as they were in love, everything seemed to be fine. They are meeting, they are laughing, because they speak about, you know, their past. But once they are married, all these cracks start appearing. You know, although, the, I mean, it's so beautiful because the aunt comes to their house, she lights a dia. I think it was the chachi, if I remember right. And even the mother-in-law accepts her later, accepts Fatima. But it's only that Fatima is getting more and more frustrated because somehow she feels that she's getting detached from her part of the world. It could be, you know, her natal home. Uh, was it a comment somehow on the institution of marriage? Because at that time I had decided, I will never get married. Well, I'm sure was. every reader is going to yeah, yeah, find yeah, all yeah, kinds yeah. of, you know, things yeah. in there which uh, I may or may not be aware yeah. of. I mean, now that you say it, I even think, my God, Om is also from a yes. very, very sort of religious yes. um, 
Lord, yes, yeah. you know, the, the name, and for, so is Fatima. Fatima. But I don't think I thought that uh, consciously yeah. when I wrote the story. And about things not being, uh, um, you know, um, a problem uh -huh. while they were in love and actually starting once they were married, I think, unfortunately, it's not what you say, I think. Hmm. I think it's just to do with the fact that actually living together and getting together brought out the little, little things which we, uh, even with the best of intentions, miss out hmm. otherwise. So in love, you are in this uh, wonderful, you know, sort of this rosy state. And you're not really, you know, up close with each other's daily habits and little, little things, you know, which come with them. And that happens after they have started really living together. You know, for instance, in the story, I think at some point he says, very innocently, yes. he says, um, uh, why are you wearing this uh, Muslimani Musal. green huh. color? Huh. And she gets upset yeah. at that. So I think it's just very innocent little uh, things which start happening every day. Um, very sort of um, ordinary sounding things. And people get sensitive about that. And I think the point the story was making was really that it is these daily, ordinary things which reveal our sensitivity which is where we need to become a little more careful and sensitive. Gee, yeah. Rather than having these great ideals, which all of us have. Right. So I think that was the point. Yeah. yeah. So her next book I'm going to talk about is Mai. Mai is a word for mother. In many parts of India, Mai, they call the mother as Mai. Um, like many South Asian women, I'm, I'm, I'm not generalizing, but it is, uh, it's also a fact that, you know, mother is somebody who's working the whole time. You know, she's catering, she's somebody's wife, she's somebody's mother, she's somebody's daughter-in-law, that's it. It's only one place in the novel that you know that her name is Raju. Other than that, she's totally eclipsed as a woman. Um, and, you know, she's, she's bent over, and I'm going to read these four lines, and, you know, we always knew mother had a weak spine. The doctor told us that later, that those who constantly bend and get this problem have pain all the time. Pain when they bend, and pain when they stand up straight. Now, they, she has two children, you know, Sunaina and Subo. Then, uh, you know, I, I just felt that in their attempt to see that Mai gets out of these traditional roles, you know, constantly telling her not to be this obedient person, don't you think somewhere they were also playing the traditional children? Of course. Absolutely, certainly they were. And again, I think um, it seems to be a um, continuing concern that I'm dealing with. You know, the stereotypes that we have or the self-images that we have and our need to become a little more self-reflexive. So the children actually think that they are, um, um, they are the ones who have resolved things. And they are the ones who have to be the saviors of oppressed people like Mai. So that is uh, already there's something, you know, which is very limited and self-blinding in that. Because they do not see the negotiations and you know, navigations that Mai does to assert herself and also to help out uh, the children. They don't notice that. They only see a stereotype of the bent woman and the uh, woman who looks like she's just doing things at the bidding of others and doesn't seem to have um, an agency of her own. So I think um, it seems to be a recurring theme that I have. And indeed, the children are like that. But in the unfolding of the novel, I think uh, the girl does become a little more sensitive than the boy mm. towards this um, oversight and undersight. You said meandering and negotiating her way through. So do you think when, if I recall... Didn't I say navigating? Navigating, and, uh, yeah, okay. yes, sorry. Navigating and uh, trying to negotiate her way through, my... Uh, if I recall right, there is a point when Parda is suggested for Sunena, you know, and uh, 
I think Mai is the one who actually extricates her from that. So she doesn't have to really be very screechy or strident or shrill, but she does it in her own way. Absolutely. And Parda in a larger sense, you know, yeah. Parda not yeah. as no, a veil, no, no, no. but yeah. in a, you know, like as a value yeah. and as a metaphor. Hmm. So, and she is uh, very clear that Sunaina will not hmm. have to wear the Parda, will not have to, will do the things she wants to do as much as possible. She is um, working towards that. So I think it is things like that that Mai is bringing out, you know. So what lies behind the very obvious image of things? Right. And the obvious image, like I said, she's constantly working at home, you know, at the bidding of everybody. But uh, I have, I don't know about you, but I have women like that in my family. My well, uh, I, I, I'm sorry I'm interrupting, but, you know, I'm, uh, Mai is the first novel which... Uh, out of the blue, strangely, somebody from Serbia wrote to me and wanted to translate it. So the first translation of it came out in Serbia, Achha. Serbian. Huh. Thereafter, <coughs> it was translated in other languages, French and German, yeah. uh, the two major ones, and of course in English as well. And uh, I did a reading tour in Europe. And you know, when I was invited to these places, when I went, I really thought, well, what is it that's interesting them about this novel? And I thought, you know, this is the West looking at... Uh, exotic East and this, you know, backward uh, family controlled uh, setup. And that's what's interesting them. And I was so amazed because everywhere the audience was saying, <coughs> we are Mai, we know Mai, my mother was Mai. And I'll, um, in one place, I remember in the audience, this was in France. Huh. Uh, a man got up and said, well, you know, she's so oppressed and she never uh, asserts herself. How can she listen to these completely unfair things that are, she's being asked to do? And, you know, here we, he, he couldn't even complete the sentence. All the women in the audience, you know, said, oh, really, they said. <laughs> so I said, uh, well, yeah. I don't have to answer yeah. anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And the last memory I have, I mean, another memory that I have of this is in Germany. Hmm where, um, you know, the, uh, I was doing this very um, arduous, um, you know, tour every two days in another place. Um, uh, so um, I went to Berlin mm -hmm. and everywhere I was meeting another person, mm. you know, so somebody else who was going to be the interpreter and going to do the reading in German. Mm. So this person, as you know, the session was about to begin, maybe it was 10 minutes before that, we've just met. And a young man, I don't know, th I was also a young woman at that time. I mean, I don't know, 30s, 40s, whatever. And he said to, he said to me, uh, before the session started, he said, Gitanjali, I want to thank you for writing this novel and for make you know, I got the chance to read it. Because after reading it, I've started respecting my mother. So these experiences really, you know, told me that Mai is actually universal. much more universal than yeah. any of us realize. Sure. So like I was saying, you know, we all have Mai's in our family. And, but the one thing which even at that time I uh, understood, and you should correct me if I'm wrong, is that, yes, traditional gender roles, if you can look at it, I mean, very stereotypical when you look at it from the outside. But once you are inside, inside that, you know, uh, their, their, their family, the silence of Mai is actually her strength. I don't think any other character in the book for me, Sunena, Subodh, even the mother-in-law who speaks more than other characters, uh, that is Mai's mother-in-law. But I think Mai's silence and her resilience, I think, was far superior than the other characters. Would you agree? Absolutely, I would agree. And I, you know, I would also say, look, I, I don't have an agenda when I set out. Mm. But somewhere, obviously, I'm concerned by the fact that people uh, just look at the obvious and look at the stereotype and think that is the entire story. Now, stereotype does tell us something about right. uh, what's yeah. happening, yeah. but there's a lot more. There's a lot more layering that we have to be alert to and aware about and sensitive towards. And I think that is what um, uh, all this, uh, whatever I have tried, seems to be taking me and wanting to take the reader towards. Right. Yeah. Now let's move to Tom of Sand, read Samadhi. Uh, you know, 
several interviews, Gitanjali speaks about how she used to read Chandamama as a, as a kid. All of us did. Chandamama, by the way, for those who do not know, was this magazine for children, which actually introduced us to a lot of mythological stories, also fantasy. You know, it became part of our lives. I mean, a bit of magic realism at that age, which we did not realize, but later did. So you had queens and kings who could turn into frogs. And, you know, it was a dystopian world to a great extent, but very interestingly written. Like, you're running, and if you turn around, you'll turn into stone. <laughs> Remember those stories? And, you know, talismans, and very interesting. Mahabharata has been a major influence. Uh, so in this book, I think, you know, you I, I haven't read all yours, but when you read Tome of Sand, it reminds you because uh, it somehow makes a connection with Mahabharata because of the plots and the subplots and the multiple emotions that you have and toing and froing, you know, of the, of the plot. Would you say that, uh, I'm sure you did not do it consciously, but, but today when you read it, it's got a lot of Mahabharata in it. Well, I do nothing consciously, yes, I think. I know. That's so. why I did that, writer, yeah. <laughs> so I think, and especially as a creative writer, I'm very happy to... Um, find out myself, you know, who, wh wh whether I'm uh, about to fly or whether I'm flying or whether <laughs> I have sort of drowned. So I'm really ready to Gee. just uh, do that uh, unknown uh, voyage. But uh, see, Mahabharata is certainly not a conscious uh, influence. But let us not forget that these are, uh, uh, you know, these are again, um, you know, tales and that we have grown up with, you know. I, I, I have not read the Mahabharat. Um, I don't know what its original form would be, but I've certainly not read it seriously from you know word oh, uh, okay. beginning to end. But in bits and pieces, I've read something in children's books, in adult books. Uh, I've heard stories yeah. in Mahabharat. So we all um, mm. in a in a in a culture where oral tradition has uh, such a big role. Hero, yes. I think we, ha in that sense, we have read it, even if we haven't read it, you know, mm. like this. Yeah. So we've all read the Ramayana and the Mahabharata and the Panchatantra and the, you know, Lela Majnu Ke Kahani and lots, Aray, of, yes. lots of other things. So obviously they must have gone into my, you know, whatever imagination um, storehouse that yeah, I have. Yeah. And it would have given me strategies or inspired strategies in me. So I think it's one would be that, but also I think we live in a time which are um, actually quite surreal, which are not linear, where all round, you know, things have opened up and uh, things have sort of, the barricades have also been built and barricades are also being broken. So in that, it doesn't somehow make sense to carry on a novel in that Victorian uh, style. Right. It has to be, there have to be uh, new, uh, what, what do you call them, dissonances and yeah. breaks. So I think it was just a very organic um, um, evolution of the novel, yeah, or but, the but style then, of the narrative. That's right. Narrative. But, you know, uh, writers write, like you said, you were not conscious of it, but maybe it, you know, seeped into your subconscious. Of but when you, when you read it today, I mean, yeah. somehow one, 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 one gets a feeling. I mean, yeah. it's a good thing. Although, let me also add that we do not, I mean, in India, we do not keep the Mahabharata at home. We keep the Gita, but not the Mahabharata, because it's believed that if you keep the Mahabharata at home, there'll be strife, because it's a story mm -hmm. which is around 18 days of war. We yeah. do Ramayana, but not Mahabharata. Um, you also speak about, you know, in the book, you, you, you speak about every book has its own trajectory. And it's actually willy-nilly impossible to steer the way it meanders, you know. Did orchestrating the story, you know, of Red Samadhi, Tome of Sand, initially give you pain, Gitanjali? Because one has read about how you read it. Apparently, you wrote it, then kept it away, then wrote it again, went back to it. So talk a little about that, the journey, as it were. Well, it took a long time writing it. So I was with the book for a very long time which obviously doesn't mean uh, just writing all the time, but you know, I would write a draft and then I would let it sit for, a, yeah. um, for some time and then another uh, um, sort of um, piece of time I would seek and then look at it again and start another draft. So it went on like that. But pain, I, you know, I, I think you know, it's also my temperament that I'm not able to think that, oh my God, I'm 
in such agony writing this book, <laughs> you know. I can't do that sort right. of drama with myself. So I don't think I really uh, went through, uh, you know, such throes of agony. But um, there's something about this book as opposed to all the other works uh, that I'd um, you know, uh, written earlier, my uh, earlier novels and stories, something excruciating about this. Oh. Um, by the end of it, I had no, I just could not understand why I did not consider it finished and ready to go to the press. So the book was done. I could tell you whatever the story is worth, I could have told you what the story is, this is where it's begun and this is where it's ended and these are the things that have happened. And yet, you know, I kept tinkering with it, kept tinkering with it, and I never felt it's time yet to show it to anybody. And uh, that, um, uh, you know, you, is something inside you has to say it's time to part Let company. Yeah. Yes. And that was, that sort of voice was not... Uh, coming inside right, me, right. and that was really um, excruciating and painful. And uh, I just want to complete it because uh, um, this is a, this is the muhavra huh. that keeps coming to me. That uh, it was like a pregnancy which had gone well past its full term, hmm. and I was feeling completely heavy and unwell. And I thought, you know, now the birth better be, and God knows, will it be stillborn or what? And uh, will it kill me or what? Mm. But you know, it was just, it had become a huge burden and a great anxiety. Right. And I couldn't believe it when it, what happened and then I could give it to the press and it was out. Wonderful. You know, of all the characters in the book, uh, Betty, Sushila, Bade, Prince, even playful Sid, um, the characters which actually stood out for me were Rosie, you know, it was Rosie and Raza, androgynous as it were. I don't know if you resent it anymore, but I don't know if you like it or you accept it. There's nothing perhaps to like or resent, but you're called a feminist writer. You know, my, it was full and full of uh, how you speak about also the name that you took, the Shri part, which is your mother's name. Uh, would you say that this juxtaposition, Rosie and Raza, uh, does it prove somewhere that we are all not one, Gitanjali, and that we are many? I'm sure. I'm absolutely sure. I, see, again, the thing is, since I don't write with an agenda, I cannot sort of tell you that this is what I was trying to prove right. or show. But I think, again, of the... I mean, I'm carrying uh, my world with me, you know, whatever I do, and my world has been growing. My world is uh, full of sort of polyphony, if you will, cacophony, if you will, whatever. So I'm carrying it all with me, and when I'm writing, when imagination takes over... Right. It comes in in strange mm. sort of ways. And I think one of the things that um, we've held very dear in our life is the unity of things. Is it, mm. I'm so, it, this sounds like another stereotype, but the diversity of things and the unity of things. Mm. And that's something which really inspired me and inspires me. And it kept sort of uh, creeping into the book in uh, whether it was characters, whether it was uh, the coming in of... Um, creatures like crows Crow, and yeah. uh, dogs, whether it was the coming in of inanimate objects. Right. You know, how can a door which for centuries has had, you know, people with different values, different experiences, different pains and pleasures go under it, how can it just remain a piece of wood? wood yeah. You know, surely it begins to feel and see. So that also became a character. So this was all happening, you know, in the course of writing. But obviously it's linked to this very pluralistic uh, world that is naturally mine and which in some ways is uh, threatened today. Right. Uh, page 94, you know, mother's walking stick. <laughs> I mean, oh. it transforms. I mean, it's a, it's a be that's beautiful piece of writing, I must say, that it transforms into this fabulous thing, you know, with rainbows and butterflies flying out. Even the, even the way Young said, you know, he, he, he imagines it to be a flute, you know. So the walking stick becomes several things. So um, usually when you talk about walking stick, it's a crutch, it's a support. But, you know, it becomes a magical object. So, you know, talk a little about that because for me, it's, it's very cinematic also. And it's very Chanda Mama to, you know, to a great extent. Well, first of all, I think it's, uh, it's 
quite amazing. I've, you know, in the uh, last year, several months, I've been talking of the, of Reth Samadhi, that is Tomb of Sand in English. I've been talking about that nonstop, and I think I still know it as little as I <laughs> did when I wrote it. So it's really, you know, you ask a question or you tell me something and that also huh, stays. That, huh. So I'm just probably becoming more and more confused about it. So hearing so much. But anyway, yeah. But anyway, the thing is, uh, it seems obviously to be reveling in the fluidity of everything, you know. So nothing is just what it is and fixed. Mm. Nothing stops there. The, that boundary is a little meaningless, you know. It can, this bottle is not just the bottle with water, no gin. Gin. In, uh, yeah, gin, gin inside it. So, well, water which can turn into gin, even as we talk, yes. yeah. So nothing is just what it is. And that is what uh, somehow was the uh, mover and shaker of my imagination as I was writing this book. So the walking stick, which should be a crutch, hmm. becomes everything except a crutch. Hmm. So, you know, yeah, so the yeah. mother is using yeah. it to scratch her feet. The mother is using it uh, almost like a magic wand, like yes. you said. And uh, she's ready to fly on it. And the butterflies on it, um, they um, alight yeah. and sit down in front of her and listen to her telling tales. Huh. So it just becomes everything. So nothing is inanimate. Nothing is just what it is. Nothing is to be, um, you know, just uh, finished by mm. pointing out its, um, uh, whatever you call it, the, um, the, the defining contours. Yeah. It is not all contained within that. Things flow in and out. So it seems that the book is revelling in that, or the author is having some kind of mad time <laughs> revelling in that. <laughs> right. So, we, you know, mother, uh, the character travels to Pakistan because that's where she grew up as a child. You. The Vaga, you know, which we've all seen, the very dramatic scene, uh, you know, in Vaga, you also, you know, it, it comes across as an, a spectacle, uh, a drama, as it were, you know, where you have a confluence of writers uh, who are known, I mean, lots of them, we all mean... The we, partition writers. Yes, the partition writers, as it were, who seem to have frozen in time. It's like they're all standing there, you know, it's, it's, it's again, it's very cinematic. Uh, you think the emotions associated with the cleaving of the two nations is very hard to ignore. I'll tell you why. Because some writers feel we have to move on from this emotional experience. You did not. You were born much after, you know, India's independence. So was I. But somehow there is a hook and we keep going back to it, you know. So um, I want to ask you that, uh, but, but do you find it very tough to let go of that? I know it's Pakistan is a theme, but then, you know, the entire Vaga dra the scene, yeah. as it were. Well, I'm going to say, I mean, allow me to yeah, sure. wander around a bit. Uh -huh. yeah. Well, um, I'll start with a recent experience in Kasoli, uh -huh. where um, at a literature festival, where um, someone who, who, was, who was in conversation with me, he said, don't you think by carrying on and on about partition, we are keeping alive a wound, which is now, you know, we've got to put it behind us. It's over and done with. Partition has happened. Oh, yeah. huh. Why don't we move ahead? You know, so again, it was a bit similar to my that uh, there was not a clamor from the audience, but there were all these Punjabis sitting there. And I said, ask them, you know, ask them, is it over? Is the wound over? Is the partition complete? So and all of them, you know, I mean, I'm sure 99% um, um, of them were in agreement with me that no, it is not over, you know, because they, it's so much a part of their daily life. I mean, all the Sardars and the Punjabis, you know, sitting there, they know they're half that side and half this side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or uh, they ha they're surrounded by stuff. People like me, you know, we don't have a yeah. direct partition experience, but um, I'm surrounded, again, I've grown up on stories of people who are half that side and half this side, and they're as much my stories as theirs, you know. So it is not over. And if there was anything which was going to be over, the new ways in which partition is expressing itself, with new divisions, new uh, divisive ideologies, yeah, yes. and uh, fanaticism. Us and them. Yeah, exactly. So I don't think, I don't think uh, anyone's actually allowing partition to be over. Eclipsed, and partition yeah. has not even resolved anything. Because um, I think that's another thing. In the course of writing the book, 
perhaps in the course of all that I was feeling and thinking and continue to feel and think, one thought of, you know, borders being made or boundaries being made, um, you know, they're necessary. But these borders and boundaries are made with a certain good intention of, um, uh, you know, defining a territory for the better working of it, not for locking this side from that side. Right. right. You know, ideally. Huh. But not many borders are doing that. So it just becomes uh, an open wound at the border, and things have not been resolved. Until they are resolved, neither that side is at peace, nor this side. Right. So I think that is what um, was behind uh, the Vagas. Yeah. And Vaga, if I may yeah. just complete, uh, I mean, another memory. But I did go to that Vaga ceremony. I mean, we went to Amritsar and we thought huh. we'll go and see huh. this. Um, everybody strident. goes. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone everybody goes. goes yeah. So we yeah. also went. And there we were sitting. And you know, they opened the um, gates, gates yeah. on the two sides. And uh, the um, soldier from that side and the soldier from this side, they come together for a kind of martial dance, which is ridiculous. <laughs> You know, both are trying to be higher than the, taller right. than the other, stronger than the other. So they, you know, six feet plus certainly, and with their, uh, what are they called, those feathers in their... Turras. Turras are even higher, higher. if possible. Yeah. And then when they kind of do this martial dance and, you know, that kick, knee goes kick up their leg and up yeah. and, you know, ah. um, um, uh, push their knee up. Hmm. If one does this much, the other one tries that much. So it's all very ridiculous. Huh. It's like some yes. completely absurd uh, hmm. dance. And you can even imagine that maybe after this, they will have uh, fun and they will laugh and they'll sit down and have tea and um, um, snacks together. But the people on either side of the border, they were not behaving like there was something funny going on. In the middle of things, you know, one of them would run down with the flag, national flag, and say, Zinda, uh, Hindustan, Zindabad, Pakistan, Murdabad. You know, so they were, and they looked so, they looked so ugly. And um, I remember sitting there and feeling very disturbed by this thing. And I, I just, I felt I don't want to look. And I, and I started looking down. And I think when I was looking down, now I'm part imagining. But I think when I was looking down, all these writers who did not understand partition, who did not belong this side or that, that side, side, and who, you know, uh, just right. uh, were not with it, yeah, yeah. they started surfacing inside me. All the writers I had read, all the things, you know, mm. that they had taught me, they started surfacing inside me. And, you know, I saw them looking as lost or I could feel how lost they were feeling because I also didn't know, do I belong this side or do I belong that side? So I think that stayed with me somewhere, that germ. germ. Much know. like Toba takes in, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah. and then when I was writing, yeah. that scene must have emerged from this. Right. And do you think we should have some gin now? <laughs> yeah. Must yeah. have turned because my friend's telling me it's just 10 minutes. So while we have gin, yeah. questions to the author, Gitanjali Shri. <laughs> Any questions, ladies and gents? There. There, yeah. Thank you. Um, I wondered if you could speak about the collaboration process with, um, with Daisy, um, particularly uh, you, you spoke about how it was, um, it was quite difficult letting go of the book and bringing it to a publisher and then revisiting that a couple of years later in the, in the translation process. Did you find there was um, a discovery in, in that translation or, or a feeling of loss in the, um, uh, in the rhythms or the, the humour from the original Hindi? Well, first of all, I want to know where you read that I found it difficult to let go. Oh, oh sorry, I, I, I thought maybe no. you'd spoke... No, I... My apologies. You said about uh, submitting the manuscript. Oh, oh. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but that was that was the Hindi manuscript, and there was no Daisy at that moment. Yes, yes. so it was just me unto my own work. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, when Daisy came into the picture, I mean, it was all very fortuitous. The publisher coming into the picture and Daisy coming into the picture was absolutely like somebody somewhere up there or down below or somewhere around planned it, and everything just fell into place. 
And later, I think, you know, partly I think it comes from the fact that I perhaps don't take myself that bloody seriously, that I was not sort of checking out too much. And in any case, I didn't have a million offers. So there was no question of, you know, sort of deciding, would I go here, would I go there? So in a way, it was a risk. I, I mean, I think in retrospect, suppose Daisy had been some other kind of translator. For instance, if she didn't have the kind of love for language and humor that I have, you know, which made us both sort of really, uh, she sometimes says we are twins. So I think it just made us, uh, uh, gave us a rapport, which I might not have had with somebody else. And somebody else could have done the translation, taken out these nuances and humor and ruined the book. But Daisy, just the further she got into the book, the more she was enjoying you know, this side of things, which for me was very important. So the questions she asked and the kinds of corners she would put me in, it was all very difficult and a different kind of exercise because like I said, I'm hardly conscious, you know. I'm not a conscious being. I work in serendipity. So I suddenly I had to do research on my own work and, you know, explain to her why I thought of that and um, give explanations, which is the last thing in my mind. But her questions constantly made me have more and more faith in her. So we did have disagreements. And uh, sometimes maybe she relented, sometimes maybe I relented. And one major uh, disagreement I remember was over the title. Perhaps you know Samadhi is a completely different concept. And tomb is something else. So the tomb is, uh, you know, you bury a corpse inside a tomb. And Samadhi is nothing to do with a corpse. It's somebody going into a state a transcendental state and maybe even coming out of that samadhi or goes into eternal samadhi. So that concept I felt was lost in tomb. And I, I was a bit uh, worried about that and I said, you know, you should, um, uh, w why not use the term samadhi, which is now in the Oxford English Dictionary. But uh, the publisher and Daisy felt that samadhi would uh, sound too much like um, this exotic East, you know, yoga and meditation and samadhi. So they didn't want the book to attract that kind of clientele. They wanted it to look like any other book. So I had to relent. <laughs> That's one place I remember. And to this day, she says very happily, no, we were right, she says. So, so that's, uh, it's all been very friendly. But I don't think I had um, uh, problems with Daisy, you know. I mean, I think the more I wised up to problems, the more um, assured and reassured I felt with her. Yeah. Anybody else? Oh my God, Sanjay. <laughs> Howard and Damon around the table were talking about how winning the Booker Prize meant that you went on this long journey. Has it changed your being? and the way that you're now looking at your, at the work that you're doing presently? Oh, it changed things completely. So, um, and you know, um, uh, Damon is one of the first people we met, Daisy and I met in Hay on Wai after the Booker. And we met this uh, writer who had recently got the Man Booker, isn't it? The Man Booker, right? Booker, booker. it's called booker. the Booker, booker. okay. So um, who, had, uh, who had got the Booker, and he's standing there with a really long face, you know, crestfallen like that. And uh, Daisy and I said, my God, what's making you so anxious? Why is he so anxious? And he said, you know, I've not been able to write at all. I'm just traveling everywhere, and you know, how can I do this? And he was just complaining, complaining, <laughs> complaining. And Daisy and I thought very, you know, so, what's the word? Super, so in a superior sort of way. We are going to be different. <laughs> but yesterday I told him, I said, I've joined the club. <laughs> so actually, it changes your life completely. In some sense, you stop being a writer for some time. But I think the gains are so great, and not just of the name and fame that you've got. I think the, uh, the way the world opens up, the way Actually, I mean, the way the Booker has returned literature and writers and books to me, you know, 
part of it is a bit sad that we look at books when they suddenly they're highlighted by somebody. That's a bit uh, unfortunate I, because I'm sure there's so many non-bookers who deserve as much to be looked at and they are not going to be looked at. So that is unfortunate. But what it does, you know, is to bring such a rich world of literature back to me that suddenly nothing else matters except books and literature. So uh, that Booker has given to me, given me a larger community. Then people ask me about the people who have not congratulated me or not celebrated with me. And I say, I can't be bothered. I mean, look at the ones who celebrated with me and look at the ones who've become my community. It's just so great. So it's changed my life. It's made it much richer, more variegated, given me opportunities like Maldives, which I would never have got otherwise. But I do feel I have to return to my writerhood, sooner rather than later. <laughs> I remember in London, just after you came back from Hay and just after the award, uh, in your opening statement, you said, the booker is great, but that's the booker. I am the writer, and there's no real connection between the booker and the writer. But now, it's obviously over this time, you're feeling that it is in many ways now one, mm -hmm. and you're much more comfortable as part of this larger celebration. Yeah, sure, sure, Sanjay. But I think I s still stand by what I was saying. By it, by it, I only meant that the booker is not something which has suddenly, you know, suffused me in such a glow that I'm, I've become somebody else, you know? I mean, the booker is there. And it's given me lots of wonderful things, but it's there and I'm here. I still feel that. And uh, I'll tell you, I've, one of the, the nicest moments I had was when somebody rushed up to me and you know, looked like she just couldn't stop herself. And she said, ma'am, I have to tell you this. So yeah, what? So ma'am, you look so much like Geetanjali Shri. <laughs> she said to me. So, <laughs> so, uh, so I, I didn't know for a moment what to say, but then I thought, my God, that's really a nice compliment. You, know? you have some idea of somebody who is suffused in the Booker glow, who looks like that. And here's this completely, you know, jhalla, ordinary person coming along. She only looks like Gitanjali Shri. <laughs> so, so I'm happy to be like that. <laughs> Is it all? Uh, are we done? Thank you so much for being a wonderful audience, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.